Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be teaching you how to play Dungeon Pets, designed by Vlad Vatel and published by Czech Games Edition. In Dungeon Pets, you are responsible for the running of a pet shop. You have your family of imps, some gold, and a dirty old cage. You'll buy pets when they're young and look after them as best you can, watching them grow, before selling them off to evil dungeon lords. But you're not the only imp that's had this great idea. A rival pet shop has just opened next door. And across the street, there's two others. You must compete with them to be the most reputable pet shop in town. Dungeon Pets is played over a series of rounds, which is tracked on the progress board. You play six rounds in a two to three player game, and in a four player game, you use the other side of the board and play five rounds. In each round, you will send out your family members to buy new baby pets, bring back cages to keep them in, go shopping for food, and so on. Every round, your pet's needs are determined using cards that you play from your hand, and you must then try to fulfill those needs. If they're hungry, you need to feed them, and if they want to play, you need to keep them entertained. Over time, your pets will grow, and eventually you'll be able to enter them into exhibitions and also sell them to customers. Each customer has certain preferences, and the reputation you will gain is based on how well your pet meets these criteria. If all of that sounds a bit too easy, then it's probably worth mentioning that things can go wrong. If you fail to meet the needs of your pet, they suffer, making them worth less when you come to sell them. Also, your pet might get really angry and break out of its cage, causing your family members to get injured and end up in hospital. And you might even lose the pet for good. And remember, there are other players you're competing with, other players who might buy the exact cage that you need right from under your nose, or buy all the meat from the shop, leaving your carnivorous pet going hungry. It's a tough job running a pet shop, but you have impish business acumen in your blood. Place the main game board on the table. Use the side according to the number of players in the game. The two to three player side has arrows between some of the spaces, as shown here. The four player side has none of these arrows. I'm going to be setting up a four player game. There's actually quite a few extra setup rules for two and three player games. I'm not going to cover them all in this video, so please refer to the rulebook if you're playing with two or three players. Place the progress board nearby. Again, use the correct side based on the number of players in the game, which can be seen by the icons in the corner. Place the progress marker on the first round space. Each player chooses a colour and takes the burrow board, the ten imp figures and two minions in that colour as well as an achievement tile to use if they get more than 50 reputation. Each player also takes one of the pet display boards, which is where you put your cages and pets. Your starting cage is the one already printed on this board. It has a physical strength of 1 and an anti-magic defence of 1. Your starting cage is also a little dirty. Place one manure token in the cage to represent this. Now, don't complain too much about your dirty cage, you got it for free off your uncle. Place six of your imps on your burrow board in the imp quarters. Also place two gold here, which is the starting money you have. The remaining four imps of each player are placed on the progress board, one in each of the spaces as shown here. These are your distant relatives, eager to join the family business. You can get these during the game. Randomly decide who will be the start player and give them the starting player token. Take the exhibition tiles and shuffle them face down, then deal one to each of the spaces here. Then flip the first one face up. This will be the first exhibition in the game, and it will happen on round two, so you always see in advance what's coming next. Shuffle the eight customers and deal one to each of these spaces face down. And again, turn the first one face up. This is the first customer who arrives in round three wanting to buy pets. Note that in the last round of the game, there are two customers. These boxes on the right side of the progress board are end game scoring. I'll cover these much later on, but be aware that some things are worth extra reputation at the end of the game. Take the cages, shuffle them face down and deal three of them into the spaces on the board here. Do something similar with the add-ons, placing two of them here. Mix up all the pets and place them in a pile near the board. Draw three pets and put them face up on the bottom row of the pet market. These pets should be size two, which means their wheels should be rotated so that two of the coloured bars are showing. Draw one more pet and place it on the top row. This pet is slightly older, it should be size 3. A quick safety tip about handling pets. Whenever you pick up a pet, make sure you hold it by the sides of the pet. This way the wheel doesn't accidentally rotate when you're holding it. If you were to hold it top to bottom for example, this can happen. 
Mix up the artifacts and place two of them on the artifact tents here. And place all the gold tokens in the bank. Place all the vegetable tokens here and the meat tokens here. The food market has three tents. One that sells vegetables, one selling meat and one selling a bit of both. Place tokens on the tents as shown here. This is the food that's available in the first round of the game. Each player places one of their minions on the zero space of the scoring track. This is the player's reputation, and remember, the goal of the game is to have the highest reputation at the end. The other minion of each player is placed on the zero space of the exhibition tent. This will keep track of your exhibition score, which I'll explain later. Place the suffering tokens, the manure tokens and the mutation tokens nearby in a supply. Take the cards and separate them by colour. Place the potion cards in a stack on the hospital. These potions are all the same, so there's no need to shuffle them. Sort the other cards into four decks and shuffle each deck. Leave room next to each for a face-up discard pile. Each player starts the game with one card of each of the four colours. Let's take a look at these cards now, as they're an integral part of the game. First of all, the cards have a big symbol in the middle, and that symbol is repeated on the four corners. Other cards, however, have two symbols on each of the bottom corners. For your first game, ignore these double symbols. They're for an advanced variant of the game, which you can find in the rulebook. The colour of the card is related to the symbol that's on it, in that most of the green cards have the food bowl symbol on them, most of the red cards depict the anger symbol, most of the yellow cards depict the ball of wool, and most of the purple cards depict the magic icon. But that's not always the case. Some cards have different symbols on them. For example, these are the four possible symbols on the green cards. On your player board, you can see a full breakdown of every card in the game. When it comes to determining your pet's needs for the round, the coloured bars on the pet show what cards need to be played for that pet during this round. And you choose from the cards in your hand which ones you want to play, so you do have some control over it. For example, if I have a size 3 baby golem, I need to play two yellow and one red card on it. But it's the symbol on the card that determines what the pet actually needs, not the colour. So in this case, my baby golem wants to play, gets a little bit angry, and is also hungry. Notice on each pet you can see in advance what all the coloured bars will be, so you get a good idea of what the pet's needs will be over the course of the game. Baby Golem has a lot of yellow and red, and if we look back at our player screens, we can tell that this means it is most likely to want to play a lot and get angry, but might also have some other needs too. Each round is divided into six phases. The steps that you follow in each phase is summarised on your player boards. Phase 1 is set up, and consists of these three steps. However, in the first round of the game, you don't do the first two steps, so I'll leave the explanation of those until later on. So in round one, the only thing you do in phase one is get income. The starting player and the player to their left get one gold, and all other players get two gold. Now, the rules are slightly different here when playing with fewer than four players, and like I did in setup, I'm not going to mention all of the changes for a two and three player game, so please refer to the rulebook for these. Imps are smart shoppers, and they're even better in groups and with gold. The shopping phase has two steps. First, all players simultaneously and secretly divide their imps and gold into groups. Then, all players reveal their groups and shopping begins. To divide your imps into groups, first raise your screen on your player board so that the other players cannot see what you're doing. Then, divide your imps and gold in up to six groups. Each group represents an opportunity to go shopping, so the more groups you have, the more chances you'll have to acquire things. However, the size of a group determines the order in which people will go shopping, and remember, you are competing with the other players. Each group you make must have at least one imp. You can include gold if you want to, but you cannot send gold to go shopping on its own. If you look closely, you'll see why. That's right, no legs. You can make fewer than six groups if you want to, and early on in the game you probably will do this because you don't have that many imps. You can also choose to keep some of your imps and gold back, but I'd always recommend using all of your imps because we'll see later on that when it comes time for them to go shopping, they can actually change their mind and just stay at home. You should put the bigger groups on the left as the spaces are larger and it helps later on to have the groups in descending size order. Once all players are done, the screens are revealed and it's time to go shopping. 
The biggest groups will go first, and the size of a group is determined by the number of imps and the number of gold added together in that group. So, for example here, I have one group of size 3, two groups of size 2, and one group of size 1. First, look for the biggest group across all player boards. That's the group that goes shopping first. If two or more players have groups of the same size, then beginning with the starting player and going clockwise, that's the order in which you determine which one of those groups gets to go first. Once all groups of the biggest size have gone shopping, you then go down to the next biggest size and repeat this process. So, for example, there's one group of size 4, so that group goes first. Then there are several groups of size 3. The starting player does not have a group of size 3, so it goes to blue, and then red, and then yellow, and then back to blue again. Then the groups of size 2 go shopping. Green first, because they're the starting player, and then blue, and then yellow. And then back to green, followed by yellow, and then green again, and so on. When it's your turn to go shopping, you actually have two options. You can either send that group of imps and gold into town to go shopping and buy something, I'll explain this later on, or keep the group at home, returning the imps and any gold they were carrying back to the quarters. You make this decision each time it's your turn to send a group. So, shopping. If you decide to send a group into town, you choose an unoccupied action space on the main game board and place all the imps on that space. The gold goes to the bank. Your imps stay on the action space until the end of the round, which means that action space cannot be used by anybody else this round. And then you get to perform your chosen action. In this section of the board, you just grab everything that's available for the space. Here you get all the meat, here all the vegetables, and here just a combination of both. And here you get both artifacts. Vegetables are placed on your board here, and meat here. There's no limit to how much food you can store in your burrow, but food will decay over time. I'll come on to this later on. Artifacts go here. Each artifact is explained in the appendix at the back of the rulebook. You can get food and artifacts even if the group that you used didn't contain any gold. How your imps were actually able to acquire these things without paying any gold, you probably don't want to know. In this section of the board, more valuable stuff is being sold. Each space allows you to take just one of the displayed things. These two action spaces are used to take one of the available cages. Note the icon on the spaces though. This means that a group sent to this action space must contain at least two imps. This is because cages are big and heavy and require two imps to carry them home. When you take a new cage, place it by the side of your pet display board. You'll move it later on. This action space allows you to grab an upgrade for one of your cages. Take one of the available add-ons and place it by the side of your pet display board. These three action spaces are for buying a pet. This one allows you to buy a pet from the top row, and these two allow you to buy a baby pet from the bottom row. Notice the icon on these spaces mean that a group of imps who want to buy a pet must have at least one gold with them. No matter how much your family members haggle and beg, pets are too valuable to be given away for free. Well, they're too noticeable to be given away for free anyway. When you gain a new pet, place it next to your pet display board. You'll place it later on. Be aware that every pet you have needs its own cage to live in, so if you are going to buy extra pets this round, make sure you also buy enough cages to put them in. In this last section of the board, there are a few special actions. First of all, this space is where you go to fill in immigration forms to allow your relatives from distant lands to come and work for you. Remember when we set up the game, four of your imps were placed on the progress board? Well, when you choose this action space, you take all of your imps from this round and all previous rounds and put them with the group you've just used on the action space. You'll get them back at the end of the round. So if you go here in round one, you'll just get one new imp. But if the first time you go here was in round three, for example, you would get all of these guys. More family members means more shopping opportunities and more help around your shop. This space is the hospital, and it has two colours because it does two different things. You get one potion card, which you add to your hand. And also, if you have any imps in the hospital, they recover, and add them to the group. You'll get them back at the end of the round. So, how do imps end up in hospital? Well, this can happen when pets get very angry. I'll explain this more later on. This space is where you volunteer to judge the exhibition for the current round. If we look at the progress board, you'll see that there's no exhibition in round 1, so don't go to this space in round 1, as it doesn't do anything for you. And finally, the platform space. 
Technically, you could go here in round one, but you probably won't, so I'll explain this space later on. At this point in the game, you'll determine what the needs are for each of your pets, and then try to fulfil them. This phase has three steps. First, you arrange your cages and pets that you just bought, then you draw need cards, and then you assign need cards to your pets. All players can do this face simultaneously, since when you assign your need cards, you do so by playing them face down. So, first you need to allocate all the cages, add-ons and pets that you just acquired onto your pet display board. A cage can go in an empty slot, or replace an existing cage, including the pre-printed one. If you do replace an existing cage, everything in the old cage transfers over, pets and any manure tokens. Once placed though, a cage cannot be moved. Add-ons upgrade one of your existing cages, or you could place it next to a space without a cage and just add the cage later. Like cages, add-ons cannot be moved after being placed, but if the cage is ever replaced, the add-on stays. Pets must be assigned a cage or they will escape. Each cage can have one pet in it. At this point in the game, your pets can be freely rearranged between your cages, but once you've decided where to put them, they must stay there until this point in the next round. Be careful if you do transfer a pet to another cage to move any suffering and mutation tokens on the pet with it. The manure tokens, however, stay in the old cage. If at the end of this step you have a pet with no cage, you lose it, and this can cause you to lose reputation, which I'll explain more later on. Now it's time to draw need cards. Remember that you start the game with one need card of each colour, and if you visited the hospital, you may also have a potion. Look at each of your pets and draw a card of the corresponding colour for each visible bar on the wheel. For example, if I have these two pets, I will draw one yellow and two purple cards for Birdie, and one green and one yellow card for Snake Kitty. All cards drawn go into your hand, you don't need to remember which cards were drawn for which pet. And also, if you have no pets at this stage, you might want to just take a couple of minutes break and go and stretch your legs, as the other players will need to do the next step without you. Now comes the fun part. You need to assign cards to your pets according to the colour bars that are showing, the very same bars that told you which cards to draw. So going back to the previous example, I now need to play one yellow and two purple cards next to Birdie, and I need to play one green and one yellow card on Snake Kitty. You want to try to assign need cards that you can actually fulfil, so try not to make your pet hungry if you don't have the food to feed it, and if your pet wants to play, you need to make sure that you've got one imp remaining at home in order to keep it entertained but sometimes things don't work out perfectly and you can get a bit stuck, and at this point, potions can really help you out. You can assign a potion card in place of any other card, so in our example, if the only green cards I had in my hand were hunger cards, and I had to play a green card on Snake Kitty, and I had no meat to feed it, then instead of playing the green card, I could play the potion like this. After you have drawn and then played cards, you should have exactly the same number of cards in your hand as you started this phase with, but they may be different ones. This phase consists of two steps. First, you resolve the need cards that you had played in the previous phase, and then in all rounds except the first, there's an exhibition where you get to show off your pets. To resolve the need cards, each player takes a turn beginning with the starting player. On your turn, you reveal the cards next to your pets, and then resolve each pet one at a time. The need cards should be resolved in the order that they appear on your player board, so let's go through them one by one. For each hunger need assigned to a pet, you need to feed the pet one food token of a type which it eats. The type of food a pet eats is shown on the pet itself. Some eat only meat, some only vegetables, and others will eat either meat or vegetables. If you're unable to feed your pet, it receives one suffering token for each food you're missing. Suffering tokens are bad, so you should try to avoid getting them whenever you can. They will make your pet worth less when you come to sell it later on. Now, some cages have this icon on them. If your pet eats vegetables and it's in a cage with this icon, then one hunger need is automatically fulfilled without you having to use a food token. And also, this add-on works in the same way, but for pets who eat meat. The next need to be evaluated doesn't need you to do anything special. You simply add one manure token to the pet's cage for each poop need that you assigned. Now manure tokens in a cage, although making it very dirty, don't have any direct impact on the game, but they could affect you when it comes to one of the exhibitions later on. 
However, if your pet gets a disease, which I'm going to explain shortly, then the number of manure tokens in the cage will affect it. Some cages are good at soaking up manure. When one or more poop needs are assigned to a cage with this symbol, add one fewer manure token than normal. Next up are these balls of wool. This means your pet is happy and wants to play. For each play need that you assigned to your pet, you must entertain it with one of your spare imps. That is, one still in your burrow that didn't go shopping. The good news is that each imp is placed between two cages, and you can actually fulfill one play need for each of the adjacent cages. A cage or add-on with this symbol means that there is toys in the cage for the pet to play with, and you can fulfill one play need for each such symbol. For each play need that goes unfulfilled, the pet suffers and gets one suffering token. Next, count the number of magic needs you played on your pet and compare it to the anti-magic defences of the cage, the big purple number. For each magic need not met by anti-magic, your pet gets a mutation token. One mutation token means that your pet will be worth two fewer gold when you come to sell it later on. Two or more mutation tokens means that the pet disappears into another dimension and you lose it. Now don't feel so bad, the pet goes off to a place where creatures with tentacles and extra eyes are considered normal, so they're very happy. And you may even get a postcard from them from time to time. Anger needs are resolved next, and they work in a similar way to magic needs. Compare the number of anger needs on your pet to the physical strength of the cage, the red number. If the number of anger needs is equal to or less than the strength of the cage, then all is okay, otherwise the pet attempts to escape. At this point, there are two options. If you have any imps remaining in your burrow, you can use them to try to catch the pet. You need one imp for each unmet anger need. However, any imp used in catching a pet is injured and ends up in hospital. If you don't have enough imps spare to keep the pet in the cage, or you choose not to use them, then the pet escapes and you lose it, which is not great. Next up are diseases, which represent your pet getting sick. If you assigned at least one disease card to your pet, then add the number of disease cards assigned to the number of manure tokens in the cage. If the total is two or less, nothing bad happens. Otherwise, the pet gains one suffering token and then an additional suffering token for each point by which the total exceeded two. For example, I have a very dirty cage with three manure tokens in it. However, this does not cause any problems for the pet on its own, but if I was to play a disease card, then the disease card plus the manure tokens is four, meaning the pet receives a total of three suffering tokens, which is very bad. Once all the other needs are fulfilled, it's time to look again at the potions. Each potion card means that you put your pet to sleep for a while, meaning that you can avoid the effects of the need card that you would have had to play if you didn't play the potion. However, you must now discard one card of the color that the potion replaced. So if I played a potion to cancel a green card, I must now discard a green card from my hand. It's important to leave the cards face up beside the pet even after you've evaluated them, because the symbols on them will be used to determine how good the pet is in the upcoming exhibition and its value when you come to sell it to customers. In round one of the game, there isn't any exhibition or customer, so you can just discard the cards now. From round two onwards, this is the time in the game where there's an exhibition, which I'll explain later on. This phase consists of the following three steps. First, each player can sell a pet to a customer. Then, you discard all the cards you played next to your pets. And finally, any imps at home who are not used can do something useful. The customers don't appear until round three, so I'll explain selling pets later on. You then discard all of your assigned need cards to the appropriate discard piles. Used potions are returned to the hospital. And finally, any imps which you did not use this round to go shopping or do other things can now be used to do some jobs. Each imp can be used to clear two manure tokens in total, but you can only clear manure from an empty cage, as it's too dangerous to go inside a cage with a pet. Any spare imp who doesn't clean manure can go round town doing odd jobs for other people and earn you one gold. Three things happen in this last phase. Your pets grow up, your food decays, and then your imps return home. First, for each of your pets, look at the window on the right. The number of arrows indicates how many steps the pet grows by. So if there are two arrows, rotate it two sizes up. And if there's only one, just rotate it once. A pet of size seven doesn't grow anymore, it's big enough already. 
Then, all food tokens you have in your burrow on the rightmost spaces are discarded. The food has become rotten. Any remaining tokens are then moved one space to the right. And finally, all your hard-working imps return home. Any that went shopping, including any new relatives or those brought back from hospital, and any on your pet display board that were entertaining or cleaning. Ones that you do not take back are any in hospital, they remain there until you visit the hospital action space on a later round, and any imps on the platform remain there until you use them, you cannot choose to take them back. Any imps on the action space of the platform are moved to the right hand side, freeing up the action space for the next round. After all six phases have been completed, you move the progress marker to the next space. And this symbol means that you move the starting player token to the next player clockwise. Before the final round, however, you see this symbol instead. In this case, you give the starting player token to the player with the lowest reputation. And if the progress marker moves to this space, it's time for final scoring. Starting in the second round of the game, you need to do a few more things. During phase one, you may remember that there were two other steps to perform before collecting income. This icon means that you reveal new stuff. Turn the next exhibition tile face up and turn the next customer face up. The exception is when you reveal the first customer for the last round, you also reveal the second one. Next, this icon means that you add new stuff to the board. Remember, this is only from round two onwards. New food is placed on the market stalls based on the numbers on the exhibition tile for the current round. This tile here shows that we will have three vegetables on the vegetable stall, one veg and one meat on the mixed food stall, and two meat on the meat stall. Food does not accumulate between rounds, so be sure to clear any food remaining from the previous round before you add the new stuff. Then remove any artifacts left over from the previous round if there were any, and then add two new ones here. For the cages, there will be at least one cage remaining from the previous round. Take the lowest of the leftover cages, place it in the top space and discard the rest. Then add two new cages. In a similar way, at least one add-on will be left over. Move it to the top space. If there are two add-ons still, discard the top one and then move the lower one to the top space. Either way, put one new add-on in the lower space. And finally, new baby pets. Any pets in the upper row are discarded, since nobody wanted to buy them. They are removed from the game, but don't worry, they go to live happily on a farm. And when this happens, add one meat token to the meat stand for this round. Now, I know what you're thinking, but I can honestly assure you there is no connection at all between a pet going to live happily ever after on a farm and one more meat being available this round. Honestly. All pets in the lower half grow in size. Rotate their wheels so that they are now size 3 and move them to the top row. Then reveal three new baby pets, set them to size 2 and place them in the bottom row. Ah, oh, look at them, so cute! Starting in round 2, there's now an exhibition during phase 4. When a player is evaluating their pet's needs, they also determine how well they do in the current exhibition. Now every exhibition needs a judge, and in this game, you can offer to be the judge for the exhibition for the current round. And of course you promise to be completely impartial and not give any favouritism to your own pets. Yeah right. When you are sending your imps out to do stuff, this action space means that you have become the judge for the upcoming exhibition. And when you do this, you move your minion marker up two spaces on the exhibition track. Look at the exhibition for the current round. These symbols indicate that this exhibition is for a single pet, so you choose one of your pets to be scored. The symbols at the top show what counts as a positive score, and the symbols in the grey box show what counts as a negative score. So for example, this is the arena. You score two exhibition points for each anger need assigned to your pet for that round, and you lose one point for each disease assigned to it. So in this example, if I put Snake Kitty into this exhibition, I score three exhibition points. Four for the two anger needs, and then minus one for the disease. Now when I say exhibition points, I don't actually mean your reputation. I mean your minion marker is moved on the exhibition track here. And remember, anyone who volunteered to judge the exhibition is already two points ahead. Some of the exhibitions are full display contests where you enter all of your pets. This one, for example, is Children's Day, where lots of young imps come round to look at your pets. You score two exhibition points for each play need assigned to any of your pets this round, 
but you lose one point for each manure token in your cages, and you lose two points for each mutation token on any of your pets. After all players are done showing off their pets, it's time to find out how everybody did. The imps on the board show how much reputation you gain for winning the exhibition, coming second, third and fourth. If two players are tied, they each receive the reputation award for that place, reduced by one for every other player tied with them. So in this example, yellow and blue both gain seven reputation. And if your exhibition score was zero or even negative, you don't receive any reputation, not even for coming last. Record your reputation on the scoring track around the outside of the game board. And then remove the exhibition tile from the board to show that this contest is over. And reset the minion figures back to the start of the exhibition track. Beginning in round three, during the business phase, a customer turns up wanting to buy your pets. Each player can sell one pet to each customer. And remember, in the last round of the game, there are two customers. You can only sell a pet that is size four or larger. If you look carefully at the pets, you will see that when they are size two and three, you see this icon. This reminds you that the pet cannot be sold, and this icon disappears when the pet reaches size four. Each customer has certain preferences, things they like to see and things they don't. This works in a similar way to the exhibitions. You will calculate the score of the pet based on these symbols. So for example, if I wanted to sell stair plant to the dungeon girl, I score as follows. Two points for each play need, which makes four, and plus one for the hunger need. However, I then get minus one because of the anger need, and another minus one because of the suffering token. The final score is three. As long as the score is positive, you can sell the pet. Some customers have very special requirements, such as Farmer Troll. He's looking for a variety of poop, so to make your pet worth more to him, you need to assign poop cards of different colours to your pet that round. Note that the symbol here means poop needs, rather than manure tokens in the cage. When you sell a pet, you will gain reputation based on whether you sell using an imp on the platform or you sell the pet on the black market. So now is a good time to explain the platform action space, which I skipped earlier on. Unlike all the other action spaces in the game, any imps remaining on here at the end of the round are moved to the right side of the platform. So although the action space can only be used once per round as normal, the right side of the platform could have multiple imps from different players. For example, I could go there in round one with one imp. Because there's no customer in round one, the imp doesn't do anything. So at the end of the round, it's moved to the right. Then in round two, let's say another player goes to the platform, maybe with two imps. Again, they're not used, so they're also moved to the right. And then in round three, a third player uses the space, again with two imps. Now, when it comes to selling a pet to a customer in round three, the blue, red and yellow players can each use an imp on the platform to gain extra reputation. If you use one of the imps on the platform, you will gain reputation equal to three times the score you just calculated for the pet. Take your imp from the platform and put it in the pet's cage. So in the previous example, Stair Plant had a match score of three, which means I would gain nine reputation if I sold from the platform. If you don't have an imp on the platform or choose not to use one, you only get two times the score instead. In addition to reputation, you also get gold for selling your pet. Look here and this shows you how much gold you receive. If your pet has a mutation token, however, you get two gold less. This is because of strict laws about the sale of mutant pets. And if you sell a pet that would normally only get you one gold and it has a mutation, then you actually have to pay one gold to the customer who is buying your pet. Imps have trouble understanding discounts. A special note about selling pets in the final round. Although there are two customers, you can only use one of your imps on the platform in total and not one for each pet you sell. I've mentioned a few ways in the game that you can actually lose a pet, but there is one I haven't mentioned. So let's recap. If when you're rearranging your pets, you have a pet with no cage, you lose it. Also, if the pet is so angry, it breaks free from its cage and you do not have enough imps to catch it, it runs away and is lost. And if a pet has two or more mutation tokens on it, it's also lost. The one I haven't mentioned yet is if a pet ever has a number of suffering tokens on it equal to or greater than its size. This means that the pet has suffered so much you lose it. It probably gets taken away by somebody for its own safety. Either way, however you lose a pet, remove it from the game. Discard any cards next to it, they will not count in the exhibitions this round. 
any manure tokens in the cage remain. As if losing your pet wasn't bad enough, you also lose some of your reputation. For each full 10 reputation you have, you lose one reputation. You see, it doesn't matter how you lost your pet. Even if it faded away to another dimension, your neighbours will still suspect that you buried it somewhere in the backyard. At the end of the game, there are two ways to score additional points. These are treated in the same way as exhibitions. These two endgame scoring opportunities are scored separately. For each one, count up the exhibition scores of each player and then allocate reputation accordingly. However, since these are not technically exhibitions, nobody can judge them so nobody gets the plus two bonus. And also, if your exhibition score in either of these is below zero, then you actually lose one reputation for each point you are below zero. The two exhibitions are business acumen, half a point for each gold you have and don't round up or down. So if you have three gold, for example, that's one and a half points. One point for each food token, potion and artifact you have but you lose two points for each imp that is not at home. This could be imps in hospital, or left on the platform, or even distant relatives still on the progress board. This next one is the pet display exhibition. Score two exhibition points for each pet you have left, and one point for each cage or upgrade, including the pre-printed cage. But then you lose one point for each manure token in your cages, even the empty ones, and for each suffering and mutation token on your remaining pets. After the final scoring, the player with the highest reputation is declared the winner. Each customer, exhibition and pet is fully described in the back of the rulebook, along with extra flavour to enhance your game experience. Also, you'll find the full rules for all of the artefacts, which I haven't covered in this video. And the rules for the advanced variant, where you can choose to use the part of the card with the double symbols on it. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play Dungeon Pets. For more of my videos, please consider subscribing to the channel. And for more great games from CGE, please visit checkgames.com. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.